Hi, welcome to the Hampton History Museum's Port Hampton Lecture Series. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we had to postpone from last week to tonight because of a citywide uh, internet outage. So we were unable to pull it all together in time for you. But I do very much appreciate you coming uh, and joining us here tonight. I have a couple of announcements, so be patient with me again. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, April 21st, uh, at 7 o'clock, we have our virtual Front Porch Music Series. Uh, Dustin Furlow will be performing. Award-winning singer-songwriter, guitarist Dustin Furlow brings you an hour of his original contemporary folk music with comparisons to songwriters such as Le Lo, uh, Ray LaMontagne and uh, virtuoso guitar players like Tommy Emanuel. Furlow has created a sound that is easily distinguishable uh, by his melding of complex guitar work and warm homespun lyrics. So please join us virtually again uh, next Wednesday night, April 21st at 7 o'clock. Hopefully very soon we'll be able to ask you to join us here in person. Uh, tonight we have uh, joining us from uh, Fort Monroe, uh, Iola Dance. Uh, Iola is a 20-year uh, employee of the National Park Service. She has served in many roles in public history and historic preservation, including at the Frederick uh, Douglass National Historic Site, uh, Carter G. Woodson Home, and the Harriet Tubna Tubman National Monument Historic Park. After serving as the National Capital Regional Ethnographer, Iola joined the team at Colonial National Historic Park as Park Historian and Supervisor of Resources, Stewardship, and Science. In that role, she manages a team of biologists, archaeologists, and collections managers. Similarly, she served as Chief of Resource Management at Fort Monroe from 2012 to 2014 with a commitment to descendant community engagement and the arts. Iola specializes in utilizing these approaches to, in discussing difficult topics in social history. She received a BA in History from Southern University A&M College, an MA in Historic Preservation from Savannah College of Art and Design, and a graduate certificate in environmental policy from the George Washington University. She's currently a third year PhD student at Howard University, majoring in history with a minor in African diaspora and public history. Her research focuses on race in the 17th century America and uh, the evolution of racialized slavery as well as opportunities for healing and reconciliation. Tonight, she'll be speaking to us about descendant engagement and unearthing collective memory in Hampton Roads. Iola, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, um, a definite thanks to the Hampton History Museum for the invitation and opportunity to discuss with you the growing descendant engagement efforts at Fort Monroe and in Hampton Roads. Um, this work connects several sites in Virginia across the country and really throughout the world to a complex and thick history, more dynamic than we can really cover in the next hour, but we will dig into the significance of 1619 landing of Africans in Virginia and the agency exhibited by freedom seekers following the 1861 contraband decision during the Civil War. When we think about uh, Fort Monroe, this work connects several sites, um, as I mentioned. Um, before I dive into the details, I want to make note, however, of institutions and working groups who have been doing this great work for several decades um, prior to the establishment of the National Park. Hampton University, Norfolk State University, Jamestown Rediscovery, and William Mary College have been key partners in leading descendant engagement over the years, especially on this topic in Jamestown, Yorktown, Williamsburg, and Fort Monroe. Howard University set the bar in defining descendant community advisory work through the efforts of Dr. Michael Blakey and Dr. Edna Medford at the African Burial Ground, which is now a national monument. Um, this particular site um, was uh, discovered in 1991. A 17th century African burial was located in um, what is now Manhattan, uh, downtown New York City. Uh, and this work really set the bar for what we consider descendant community engagement. 
Today, the descendant community rubric created by the National Trust and Montpelier is essential as a document used to plan for and evaluate descendant engagement. Also of note, throughout the Northeast, but particularly the Mid-Atlantic, is the work of Dr. Cheryl LaRoche and Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis in exploring broad histories of African Americans in slavery and freedom, especially women, and to include communities who identify as both native and of African descent. I was introduced to the local descendant engagement effort at Jamestown and Yorktown by acting superintendent Steve Williams and archeologist Dwayne Scheid. Through a collaborative project with Jamestown Rediscovery and William and Mary, we've been able to continue archeology span since 2016 and now transition into a dynamic descendant engagement project in collaboration at the intersection of race gender, age, and geographic areas, providing a polyvocal perspective that shares in the history of 1619 and contraband histories. From this work, the commonality across communities is the commitment to remembrance, remembrance of the African-American experience in Hampton Roads. As many of you know, Virginia was inhabited by over 30 tribal groups this area was home to the Kikatan and the Powhatan Confederacy. This information and history is foundational as we explore the making of America and acknowledge all of the communities and histories significant to telling a full history. So collectively, Jamestown, Fort Monroe, Williamsburg, and Yorktown tell the history of English settlement of the New World, the evolution and dismantling of American slavery, and defense of the Chesapeake during several conflicts, the American Revolution, War of 1812, and of course, the Civil War. These sites also tell the history of an African-American identity, the rise of individual versus monarchical, uh, monarchical uh, sovereignty, and the, um, excuse me, my uh, screen actually just switched on me. Um, sovereignty and, um, excuse me, one moment I, while I resolve a technical issue here on my screen. So as we deal with the rise of individual versus monarchical uh, sovereignty, this is that transition from a, uh, a king and queen um, and to individual rights. So this is our exploration of the Revolutionary War and those legacies that um, define equality, justice, and liberty for all. So as I dig into our history here, Fort Monroe National Monument was established by presidential proclamation on November 1st, 2011 by President Ob Barack Obama. This was the first use of the Antiquities Act by President Obama. Uh, this established Fort Monroe uh, based on its significance of natural, historical, and scientific importance. In partnership, we work with the City of Hampton, Fort Monroe Authority, and of course the National Park Service. But the importance of Fort Monroe is recognized for some time uh, it was recognized as a National Historic Landmark. A National Register nomination has been in place for several decades. And we had the opportunity in collaboration with the 400 Year Commission to commemorate over 400 years of African American history in 2019. I want to take just a minute to acknowledge the National Park Service and the roots of our vision and mission, um, which is based on the 1916 Organic Act, and make note of our commitment to interpreting these places for future generations. There are over 420 parks, sites, and networks throughout the park system that all collectively help us to interpret and preserve these historic places and natural wonders. I'd also like to take just a moment to tell you a little bit of a personal story. 
My family is from Louisiana. And at the end of the Civil War, my grandfather, great-great-grandfather, excuse me, was an orphan in Mississippi and likely hopped trains to New Orleans. He later became a longshoreman and at some point, he invested in the Black Star Line and Mound Bayou Oil Company. We have here a photograph that I wanted to show you because it demonstrates the ways that our family heirlooms and our treasures, like tintypes or derogatypes, letters, um, records that we keep and save, how they help us to corroborate those oral traditions, those stories that are passed down generation to generation. My grandfather wrote a letter to court, my great-great-grandfather my wrote a letter to court my great-great-grandmother. And that letter really provides the kind of insight into a few things. When did he learn to read and write? When we think about contraband and when we think about the African-American experience, I then wonder, how did he become a longshoreman? How did he learn about the Black Star Line? Did he have the opportunity to hear Marcus Garvey speak? Did he have the opportunity to hear Booker T. Washington when he gave the groundbreaking speech at the Mound Bayou oil mill? These are all things that circulate in our minds as we start to explore and think about not only our individual and our family histories, but these larger national narratives and actually think about the way that we, it is personal. It's part of our individual story, but it's part of this bigger, larger narrative of the nation. A colleague, Agina Rogers, has a similar story. Uh, Agina is the site manager at Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site. And Agina is the descendant of James Fields. James Fields arrived here at Fort Monroe in 1862 following the contraband decision. Agena today is a living history artist in addition to being an interpreter and she continues that legacy established by James Fields who in seeking his freedom later became a lawyer and a delegate in Hampton after his education at what is today Hampton University and what began as Hampton Agricultural and Mechanical School later Hampton Institute, and now the university that we know and love. When we think about these stories like Agena's, um, we are able to dig deeper into not only the history and names and dates, but understand that there are people who the history is relevant to today, and that those people, their identities are connected directly to that history. When we think about those communities, it's not only a local community, it is of course a national community, but as we're learning, it is also an international community. So through the work that we do as uh, historians and as ethnographers, we are identifying not only those records that tell us the history, but actually help to support oral traditions. Those oral traditions are continued by lineal descendants, oftentimes by self-identified communities who may not have that lineal descent but see themselves and have a connection to the history. Sometimes it's also interested parties who have a commitment to telling the stories. And so through the United Nations Sites of Memory, Memory Program, Fort Monroe is now able to enter into an international story significant to 1619 arrival, through that history of the Middle Passage and Atlantic slave trade and includes the dissolution of slavery following the 1861 contraband decision. When I talk about descendants, I'm not only talking about African Americans, I'm also talking about descendants of slave holding families, I'm talking about communities who consider themselves to be native and black um, and as we think about this from a world perspective, we also start to think about those who were descendants of slave traders. This is a difficult and dynamic history that is oftentimes challenging. And so again, I point to the resource as defined by the National Trust and Montpelier in the descendant engagement rubric. Collectively, 
we are able to really and truly explore the history of slavery, resistance, and freedom uh, through this work by engaging descendants and working with communities. To dig deeper into the 1861 contraband decision, this particular history begins with the arrival of Baker, Townsend, and Mallory, three freedom seekers forced into servitude in Virginia at Sewell's Point by the Confederacy during the American Civil War. As these freedom seekers arrived at Fort Monroe, they were granted audience with General Benjamin Butler. General Butler, being an attorney, rationalized keeping these men as contraband of war. This is where a very challenging topic or challenging word becomes connected to the history of freedom seekers. We acknowledge this program through our national network of underground, National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Baker, Townsend, and Mallory were then followed by tens of thousands of African Americans, not only here in Hampton Roads, but throughout the country, wherever they could find refuge behind Union lines. When we think about Fort Monroe, there's the Grand Contraband Camp that was established here once all of the needs were realized for contraband for freedom seekers who arrived at that time. That included education, food, clothing, medical attention. All of these things were the reality for freedom seekers who arrived in Hampton Roads. There was also a legal um, reality around contraband decision. In and of itself, it wasn't binding, but the first and second confiscation acts allowed General Butler to continue to allow refuge as well as the War Department to continue to allow refuge to freedom seekers. Additionally, it allowed for the establishment of the United States Colored Troops. Once the United States Colored Troops entered into uh, service during the Civil War, it increased the need for hospitals. I have here a photograph of Harriet Tubman, who we understand to have been recruited to serve the contraband hospital here at Fort Monroe. Tubman, being literate in different ways than we oftentimes think about, was actually a very accomplished nurse. And so her skills were of great use here in the area. However, her limited literacy may be a reason why she was not allowed to become the head matron of the contraband hospital. And so she only stayed for a short while before returning to Auburn, New York to assist her family, and then later heading to South Carolina to lead the first uh, woman-led raid, armed raid, on the Combahee River, where she assisted over 700 people to freedom. This history is intertwined throughout the Mid-Atlantic. And there are so many persons who have been involved in helping us to unearth this history. It is not limited to the history books, as we say, but legacy keepers who carried on the history when at one time it was, it was thought to be a myth. At that time, organizations like the Contraband Historical Society actually maintained that history and brought that history forward. Uh, Contraband Historical Society was founded by Ms. Jerry Hollins, and the membership today continues to collaborate with us here at Fort Monroe. Each year, we come together in May, following the uh, in commemoration of the agency exhibited by freedom seekers. Um, we offer tours, and there are traditions that are, are represented by the descended community that continue to be part of that programming. So when we think about um, traditionally associated groups, we're oftentimes thinking of Native American communities. Um, in the African American context, um, it shows up as drumming circles, pouring of libations. Um, in other areas, it could include subsistence fishing or even using the example of the Gullah peoples, 
It could include basket making. And so when we come together at Fort Monroe, part of those traditions that the Contraband Historical Society and other organizations brought forward as essential, as part of the telling of the story, include those ceremonies and those music ways that help us to stay connected and remember and recognize ancestors. This is an intergenerational effort, and this is an effort that brings people together to talk about often divergent views. Uh, if you notice um, in, this, uh, in the images that I have, um, you have a, a, the Jefferson Davis Memorial Arch in the background. This particular event I attended and there was a young girl there, as I'm looking at the living history interpreters, telling her about this incredible history. And I really had to pause for a moment and think about myself and having grown up here in Hampton Roads. And seeing Jefferson Davis on streets, schools were named after him, and all of these different places. And understanding how a site like Fort Monroe, which was a Union stronghold, um, would have been remembered for so long as the place that imprisoned Jefferson Davis, more so than the place of African arrival or of this effort or act of agency exhibited by freedom seekers in 1861. So today, the partnership with the Fort Monroe Authority, the National Park Service, Contraband, Historical Society, and others, we are able to really rewrite that history and so these collaborations help us to bring forward untold stories, um, marginalized stories, underrepresented stories, and stories that, that were once thought to be a myth. We now have so much great documentation, um, and I mentioned our partners at Hampton University, um, Norfolk State, William and Mary, um, they also continue this research um, at sites like Fort Monroe, but also Yorktown, which has a history connected to contraband camps. Um, and, connect, and Jamestown has that same history connected to 1619. As we continue in remembrance, that is key and essential in understanding the work that we're doing with descendant community engagement. What is common among the group of descendants is this emphasis on remembrance, on taking that time to remember the arrival of, of Africans in 1619 or African landing at Point Comfort. And that arc of history in terms of the evolution of slavery and dissolution of slavery with the contraband decision. Now the contraband decision is part of a series of important events that happen that ultimately lead to freedom, definitions of citizenship, um, and ultimately voting rights. Um, we connect that long history, that long 400 year history at Fort Monroe. And our partners here are able to help us in um, making that connection and, and continuing that legacy. Some of the ways that we've gone about doing that is through scholars roundtables, through workshops. Uh, we have a foundation uh, document that identifies our um, fundamental resources and values. And we work with a, a community of uh, subject matter experts who help us to bring this history forward. Some of those groups include the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the African American Historical and Genealogical Society, and the Association of African American Museums. Additionally, the Organization of American Historians, as well as the American Association of State and Local Historians. We are able to come together collectively with resources, subject matter experts, and pursue the kind of studies that bring forward this history that as I described was once thought to be forgotten. I had the opportunity to work on similar projects in the Mid-Atlantic with the National Park Service that really introduced me to these ideas of descendant and community engagement and the importance of this work 
first by working with Monocacy National Battlefield Park in Maryland. Um, in Frederick County, Maryland, this particular site pursued an archaeological study that revealed the slave quarters at a plantation that was established immediately following the Haitian Revolution. That particular site did not know that this history was significant as it predominantly interpreted a, a specific day of the Civil War. Additionally, I worked with a descendant community and American University on, the, on Manassas National Battlefield Park. At Manassas, there's a long history of uh, the Confederate history at that site, and we were able to expand and remember a history that was also connected with James Robinson and his descendant community, his descendant family, and their annual reunions that were held until the 1990s. Sadly, a historic house associated with that history um, burned down in the 1990s, and it represents that connection that's necessary between descendants and the landscape. Descendants and a specific structure could even be collections and stories. And so this is that sort of layering of the work, the community and the places and resources that are important um, that we're able to unearth and, and move forward. Another site um, of, of interest uh, that, that I would mention is uh, in Richmond, and um, we've been able to collaborate um, with Dr. Joseph Jones and Dr. Audrey Horning from William & Mary on moving forward these um, best practices in connecting with descendant communities. One of the things that, that we hope to do as we continue this uh, incredible work is really continue to connect the stories to help communities to see the ways in which Fort Monroe is connected to these larger narratives um, and possibly your family history is connected to these larger narratives. So as we're able to preserve photographs, letters and documents, oral histories, and connect them to the research, to the documentation, we're able to better explore how these histories help us to tell a full and more complete history. Part of what I would like to do right now is actually go back um, to the description of lineal descendants. When we think about uh, lineal descendants and self-identified descendants, this is actually a big part of the work. This is a critical part of the work, um, especially in communities um, where we don't always have that documentation and it has so much to do with our connection that we feel to the history. And these descendants um, could be of enslaved Africans, free Africans, uh, African Americans, Native Americans, Native and Black, and slaveholding families. It is really dynamic and um, interesting what we've experienced, uh, especially following 2019, in our ability to bring together communities um, for opportunities to talk about difficult topics in history. Um, and that opportunity is not only limited to the research and the sharing of the stories, but it's especially related to the desire for healing and reconciliation. That is a big part of the effort um, that we are now part of in uh, being recognized as a site of memory associated with the Slave Roots Project. The key themes here that we continue to revisit are resistance, slavery, and freedom. Resistance, liberty, and heritage thinking about the way in which, as Americans, we value equality, liberty, and justice. These are all of the fundamental um, ideals that bring us together time and again to talk about the importance of descendant community engagement. As you take a moment to um, consider um, the 1861 contraband decision, 
um, part of what um, you have the opportunity to consider are the risks that uh, freedom seekers took in traveling to Fort Monroe. Uh, for many of the uh, persons who were um, seeking refuge here were women. Um, many of them were children and they did not have resources. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, as well as the American Missionary Association uh, came together to respond to the needs of freedom seekers who arrived as contraband. Um, they were able to provide rations as well as uh, some resources, but it was not the promised land that uh, freedom seekers had hoped for, but it did turn out to be a different um, in environment. It was not the plantation, and it was better to seek that opportunity for freedom than to remain enslaved. And so tens of thousands of freedom seekers arrived. When we look at the historical record, we see how we start with Baker, Townsend, and Mallory, three men who sought their freedom. And within several months, over 900 uh, freedom seekers were here in Hampton. And within that year, over 10,000. And this repeated itself throughout the Mid-Atlantic and the country. Now, when you start to work with descendant communities, you find that they relate to this topic in different ways. Uh, some of them don't actually use the language uh, contraband. Uh, and even Frederick Douglass, during um, that historical time period, cautioned freedom seekers from using the term contraband. Um, as Butler even argued, it continued this idea that they were property. And so this is definitely a history of reclaiming humanity, of men being men and women being able to be women, and looking at this history and understanding the, the, the men and women of Hampton Roads, we learn not only of iconic figures like Tubman, but also lesser known figures like Mary S. Peake, and those who um, provided education to contraband uh, here uh, in Hampton Roads. One of the sites that is really unique and significant to the telling of the contraband history is actually Emancipation Oak located at Hampton University. This is where we understand the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation to have taken place. Similarly, at Fort Monroe, there is a 400-year-old oak tree, over 400-year-old oak tree, named Algernon Oak. We consider these trees to be witness trees and to be part of the ethnographic um, understanding of place and of history. And these um, resources help us to think about all of the lives, all of the stories, and all of the people who um, were on the landscape. Uh, and who helped to contribute to this narrative of the making of America. Through the contraband decision, um, we are able to really dig into those histories of resistance, of agency, of risk, of desire for freedom over anything and over all, of liberty and rights as African Americans who were free or considered contraband or served the United States colored troops collectively moved towards freedom for African Americans during the American Civil War. We hope that you will join us, as I mentioned, uh, virtually this year for the contraband commemoration. We expect to have an event um, that will span the weekend of the 20, leading into the 24th. Um, and we have something really exciting planned for you. So please stay tuned and watch the National Park Service, uh, Fort Monroe National Monument website, as well as the Fort Monroe Authority website, as we share more details on how we will commemorate and stay connected with you um, during this global pandemic. We thank you so much for continued support over the years. Um, especially in this past year as we've all adjusted. Um, we anticipate continuing programming um, that will explore the evolution of freedom 
um, with our partners at Fort Monroe. Um, we plan to um, celebrate uh, Juneteenth as well as um, we have unique programming planned throughout the summer that will lead us up to the African Landing Day in August. Again, I share with you our um, community uh, or additional resources um, that you might want to consider as you explore your personal history, your family history and community histories, as you think about sharing um, those um, treasures uh, with national parks and museums um, like Fort Monroe, we hope that we hear from you and that we are able to connect our site and our histories um, to your um, narratives and to the topics that you um, care about. I thank you um, for this opportunity to uh, talk with you. I will be able to answer questions as Alan um, rejoins us. I do apologize for my technical difficulties. I did lose some of my notes, but once Alan uh, returns, I will be able to pull up um, some of those points that um, I may have missed, um, but thankfully um, talk about uh, quite often. Um, so I will stand by while we uh, prepare uh, to start taking questions. I hope that uh, in the chat uh, you've been uh, making note of all of the questions you have about Fort Monroe, about descendant community engagement, about unearthing the past, uh, the questions you have on uh, descendant engagement, and, um, and we will make this a lively discussion. Thank you, Yola. That was a, a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is a little off topic, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a question about the status of the renovation of Quarters One. Oh, that's a great question. So Quarters One is the location of the contraband decision in the sense that we know that this was where General Butler lived and where his office was located. Um, and so the National Park Service is actually in collaboration with the National Park Foundation um, to begin stabilization efforts within the year. Uh, and so this will um, help us to preserve character defining features um, while we prepare um, for a full rehabilitation of Quarters One. And it will absolutely be one of the core um, tangible resources um, where we tell the history. And if um, any of you have not had the chance to visit Fort Monroe, um, quarters one is the photograph in the bottom right-hand corner um, of the image that you see here. So a question for me then, will quarters one then be open to the public as a, as an, as a museum, a uh, historic site? Our hope is to be able to uh, provide guided tours of uh, quarters one. That's our long vision. Um, we currently include it on the walking tour uh, in partnership with Fort Monroe Authority. Um, and it is part of the uh, living history program um, that we present in collaboration with the Contraband Historical Society. Very good. Uh, I have a couple of comments that seem to have uh, uh, latched on to uh, a need for a little more clarification or a little more information sure. about the linear uh, descendant documentation, mm -hmm. which does seem to be critical. Yes. So if you mind yes. expounding a little bit on that. So this is um, probably what most would consider your traditional genealogical research. Um, and especially in um, ethnography work in native communities, oftentimes demonstrating that lineal descent was essential um, in uh, tribal or federal recognition. In the African-American context, um, it is uh, typically challenging um, in uh, doc documenting um, genealogy. It's not impossible, it can be done. So, but it oftentimes just looks different. And so um, you may have a family Bible that has uh, documentation of births or much like with, the, um, with Isabella and Antony, there's a baptism of a baby and that's how um, you're documenting um, through empirical evidence, through primary source data, um, a birth. 
Um, and so, so that's part of what is um, uh, necessary or fundamental to documenting lineal descent. Um, you might use census data. Um, there may be church records, um, court records. All of these things help us um, to, through a tangible resource, to, 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 to pinpoint that um, connection. But in the African-American um, experience, it's oftentimes the most challenging piece, not only because it's difficult um, to um, locate, but oftentimes it's in collections, but it's not um, processed in a way where you find, oh, this was Psalm, or this was an enslaved person. And even if they are in the record, they may not be characterized that way. So um, Alan and I have been talking a lot about 1619 today, waiting for this discussion. And oftentimes you find that um, in the record, you'll see servant, um, you'll see slave, you'll see Negro servant or Negro slave. Um, and so then we have to use our judgment today to determine what was meant at that time. And is this uh, Angela, a Negro woman, uh, in the Pierce household, you know, and was she enslaved or was she free? Was she indentured or was she um, enslaved in the way we learned and understood slavery to evolve? Very good. Uh, I have uh, another question just popped up. Uh, a number of enslaved men from the Middle Peninsula uh, hailed Navy ships, uh, were accepted as contraband, and eventually joined the Navy. Do you have any records of these inductions which took place at Fort Monroe? You know, I would have to check with um, two of our scholars. Um, well, one of our, our team members, Aaron Firth, um, if he is uh, watching, he might be able to answer that question more directly than I will. Also, there's uh, a gentleman in the area, um, Colonel West, who actually studies and interprets um, you, uh, African American Navy um, personnel. And so I, I would have to refer to one of those uh, experts um, to give you uh, more detail. But what I know is that we have been collaborating with them and working with them to tell that history. And so there, there is um, a lot more that we know now than we did in the past. One of my favorite answers as the curator here is, I, I don't know. know that, but I know how to get that answer That's for right. You. <laughs> uh, a question from Agina uh, Rogers. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or a Many times the last names are not there, which makes lineal uh, hard to follow and untangle. That is so true. Um, and oftentimes um, nicknames are used. And so you have to really train yourself and learn to understand and recognize um, how African Americans are represented in um, the historical record. Um, not only are they sometimes um, only first names, um, but as I mentioned, nicknames or they simply say Negro, Negro woman, Negro man, Negro child. Um, and so this is the challenge when you enter into African-American descendant engagement is that you may get, end up led to this point that simply stops. So in that work, we tend to accept um, self-identified descendants. So um, that's consistent with the um, descendant community engagement rubric that um, one who feels a connection to that history is accepted and on the same footing as a lineal descendant. Um, and so it's that commitment to understanding the history and remembering um, the ancestors that brings that group together. All right, and you, you transition into our next question oh, wow. uh, from Ebony Davis. Uh, can you speak to the incorporation of self-identified descendants in your work? So much of my work has um, actually included self-identified descendants, especially in uh, the last uh, three years. And so um, part of what we've done was uh, several sites that I mentioned, Monocacy National Battlefield Park, Manassas National Battlefield Park, uh, Jamestown and Yorktown, we were all working with descendant groups. And uh, we were noticing that um, some of those sites had a genealogy or had the opportunity to do the genealogical work, um, 
But if we did, would we decline or deny someone participation was ultimately a, a question. And um, the reality is that, that no, um, there, there's no real way to do that. Um, and so at all of these sites, um, we have included those who see themselves as connected to the history. Um, and in truth, it really provides for a more, um, I think, uh, dynamic conversation um, because most of those sites have become somewhat of a, a pilgrimage. And, and as I mentioned, an opportunity for healing within and across communities. So to, to not include a self-identified descendant would be to disrupt that opportunity for healing and reconciliation. I love that term, an opportunity for healing. Um, another question, uh, would your record have information about slaves who fought in the war for independence? So this is an area where I haven't found as much information related to Fort Monroe, um, and we are interested in uh, finding that information. Um, the uh, director uh, and um, preservation officer at Fort Monroe have, uh, they found some documentation that um, supports uh, the idea that Cornwallis actually considered Fort Monroe as a location to mobilize and then dismissed it for the same reason most people have had challenges with Fort Monroe in, in past history. Um, the, the water is brackish in Fort Monroe, so you don't have fresh water. And so it is um, challenging in that way, even though it's bountiful in other ways, right? And so um, what we have not um, identified um, at Fort Monroe is, is that connection to um, the Revolutionary War through African American service. But I, I think it would be interesting to pursue that, um, considering what we know in terms of Lord Dunmore offering freedom um, for those who sided with, um, with uh, the British, uh, in contrast to those who, if they had chosen to support patriots, um, I think there's a huge question of fighting for freedom and liberty and justice for all, but the possibility that it would not include you. It does not mean that there were not African Americans, of course, who fought um, for patriots and for the American Revolution on the side of, um, of the Federalists and of um, what became the United States, but that had to have been a difficult decision to make, um, especially with this idea of freedom being sort of dangled as a possibility if you chose to fight with, with the British. All right, well, thank you very much. Let me see if I can make my way back to the camera as we wrap up. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Yola. Uh, lots of uh, good input from our, our, uh, our folks here. So thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, uh, keep in mind all those uh, wonderful things that we've talked about tonight. Also keep in mind, uh, next Wednesday night on the 21st, 7 o'clock here, we're going to have our Front Porch Music Series. So uh, join us then. And uh, always, uh, the first Monday of the month, barring holidays, you'll find us here uh, for the Port Hampton Lecture. So continue to join us uh, virtually. And hopefully soon uh, you'll be able to join us in person. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.